My name is Clara Schilder. I'm from uh, Leipzig in, in Germany, where we do in our lab, we use these tools that have been presented to you to do vaccine design. And you already see the semi logo on here. The program that we're working in is a semi program. And I also want to mention, this is not a single person effort. Like it takes a whole team to design a vaccine. And a lot of the people that are crucial for this are also this room, I think. Haven't. So there's a couple of people that have been part of his efforts to make vaccines, which I think is really, what Sebi has been really good about is about creating teams around the world to work on vaccine design. Vaccine design, to just really briefly go into this, this is kind of a traditional way how we have to make vaccines in the past. It's, we need an antigen to make a vaccine. This is how we start. And in the past, there have been very different ways on how to get to this antigen. Like we have been using just real virus and messaged it until it wasn't uh, dangerous anymore. Uh, but today we really want to understand what this antigen is and be able to define it more clearly. There's obviously a lot of like, testing involved, like characterizing these antigens, going back and re-optimizing them. And there's obviously also preclinical work like animal models, testing the safety and the efficacy of these before we go into humans. There's also more choices you have to make along the way. So it's natural that Often also candidates fail. And in order to be more efficient and to be more effective along this way, one of the things we want to do is like we want to be as good and fast as possible at making these antigens because if we fail at the step, all the other things are going to fail as well. And kind of as Andrew said, we, we think like AI and computational design can actually help us um, get faster and better at this and kind of like to, on the other hand, back and form, but also be able to mitigate risks along this antigen design process. And there's actually some things you need to consider when you design a vaccine about these proteins, because they're really complex proteins. And this is this is very protein that everyone kind of has seen before. Um, they actually exist in what we call multiple conformations, so they change their shape. And we are interested in the first shape and not the second shape, because the first one is uh, the point where the, the, the protein is kind of active, it allows uh, the virus to enter to the cell, and then it needs to change its conformation in order to release the genome into the cell. And that's what's happening. And if you make uh, like the wrong shape into your vaccine, you're not gonna have an effective vaccine at all. <clears throat> and it's not gonna be useful. So what we really wanna do is that we wanna get this first for the modification. This is the one that we really wanna get right. And this is why we wanted to protein design on it. Also turns out we need even more protein design tools because this is not everything. Like along the way to make a vaccine, you also need a couple of other things you need to think about. And one of them is reagents. Can't make a vaccine if you don't have reagents at hand. You also think a lot about the yield. How much can you make of an antigen? Because this very directly alludes to how many doses, dosages can you make in the end. We've all learned this is very important. Protein stability can allow me to use very different platforms. So everyone nowadays knows mRNA, but also there's protein vaccines or DNA vaccines or all kinds of different systems. And depending on how my antigen works, like I, I have options to choose from. Viruses change with all of that. So how can I, can I use these tools to kind of be faster than evolution or think ahead of time. And one of the other things where also the IPD has been really leading is in how can I present this antigen to the immune system. Um, and in all of these steps, we can think about using protein design. I'm just gonna show you how we do computational design of arena virus glycoproteins, which is one of our prime projects. to just show you kind of how these steps work. Um, and we've been seeing a lot of these AI tools that we've been seeing from completely generating proteins in the world. Obviously, when we design an antigen, that's not what we're interested in. We mostly want to keep most of that antigen attacked. We just want to make it a little better for our purpose. So mostly we change as few amino acids as possible to make this antigen happen. So this is kind of how these workflows could look like. That's how we do it. So in the beginning, we have computational design steps, and they could come from very different tools, like Rosetta has been mentioned, protein MKN has been mentioned, or sometimes we just make new tools ourselves, like here, a tool to better design proteins. Once we have mutations that we're interested in, we take them and bring them to the lab where we um, express a couple of these proteins and look whether mutations that we're introducing are actually enhancing stability, yield, binding, 
are they becoming better uh, vaccines? In the end, we have a set of mutations that we want to introduce. And sometimes it's actually just two or three mutations that you need to make that antigen be that vaccine that you want to be. And obviously, there's a lot of testing involved. So you're never going to just go with one, but you're going to go with a couple. And this is actually the Hooling virus spike protein, which causes the Argentina fever. It's been one of our prime projects. We work together with other scientists in Oxford to test these and actually test these in different platforms and try to learn whether the designs we made are actually going to be working. This is how we think about the antigen design. And I'm just going to very briefly show you um, one of our de novo design approaches where we think about creating reagents, which is just as important as creating antigens. Because um, along the way, you also have to test whether people actually make neutralizing, anti uh, neutralizing antibodies whether the antigen is in the right confirmation, you need to control it when you produce it. So tools are just equally important. And this is where we come back to a lot of these diffusion methods. So this is an example where we use the Nipah virus black protein. That's another virus, very dangerous actually, really high fatality rates. And one of the proteins, it's also a protein that sh sh shifts the shape a little bit and moves around. And this is funny little domain, which is one of the most important ones to target with antibodies. So here we have been using these diffusion methods that you've already been seeing, where we create protein out of random noise uh, to bind to the protein. And you see that out of nowhere, generate the protein backbone, and the side chains. And in the end, we have to make a choice which ones we buy, which ones we produce. And then we go to the lab and we actually produce some. And my lab is fairly small, so we normally don't order so big orders, and we order like 10 to 20. And this is just showing you what happens in the lab. You actually produce them, and then you put them on a the gel, and whenever there's a new lab, you actually have protein. And you can already see on that gel that there's a lot of protein. It should be pure, which if it's a big band, is always good. 